hallelujah. So we are preparing our hearts to receive the word of God. We invite our sister Valentina to give us a solo as we prepare to receive from Elder Dr. Anthony Karikari. The Bible makes us understand that God is not a man that he should lie. Neither is he the son of man that he should change his mind. He says that has he said anything, then will he not do it? You will never, ever change. You are the Lord. You remain the same. You You're the old Safi. 
said our God does not change, but he works in the changing environment of men. Oh, he is a wonderful God. Let's take a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much that you do not change, but in our changing circumstances, you are still with us. No matter what is happening to the world, you are aware, and very, very soon you will fix it. We therefore have faith in you, and we thank you. We pray today you will heal us and you prepare us for the work that is ahead of us. We give you praise and honor in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Now I want to thank God for the whole week. It has been a very wonderful week where we are dealing with the team possessing the nations, the power of the new creation. Now, you see, if you are not a new creation, you cannot do the work of possessing the nations because you need that qualification of being a new creation or a new creator before you can do that. And today we want to just delve a little bit and put together pieces that we have had throughout the week. And the week two has been a week of prayer and fasting for the nation. And we believe very, very much that God has started something and he will do it. Because we know our God, he has done it before. Those of you who are very young, in 1983, there was famine in this nation. And we thought we were going to die. We didn't die. God showed forth himself strong. In COVID, you knew what was happening. We couldn't breathe. Now you are breathing. This same God will fix it. Hallelujah. So don't be afraid. Now, we say that faith has to have some substance to stand on it. And what we are standing on to believe that our God will do is that he has done it before. Even in this nation. Hallelujah. And in the Bible that you have read, and in the life of your brothers and sisters, he has done it. So, he will do it again. Ghana will bounce back. Praise the Lord. Because Rollins time, we did structural adjustment. And we did so many, so many economic restructuring. Oh, Palm Sky, praise God. So many models. But here we are. God will do it again. But what I want to tell you this morning, that you are a new creation. And you have the power to change circumstances. Now, maybe you think I'm talking on top of my head, so let's read some Bible. Praise God. So after that, we can talk. Amen. Now, the text has been Ephesians 4, 24, the first one. Then we have Colossians 1, 13, Matthew 5, 13 to 16. And I think we are looking at these verses to understand what we're supposed to do. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 20, is it 24? He said, And to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Hallelujah. Then Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves. Amen. And then if we go to Matthew chapter number 5 and the verse 13 following, it said that you are the salt of the earth. 
But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. Then the next position you are, he says, you are the light of the world. A city or the hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds, and praise God your Father in heaven. Amen. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, the Bible says, If anybody is in Christ, is a new creation. The old is past. Behold, the person is new. Hallelujah. Now, if you are saved, then you are a new creation. Are we saved here this morning? So all of you, I'm announcing to you that you are a new creation. And if you are a new creation, then there has been a certain change and transformation in your life. And so the old has passed away. Everything has become what? New. So the pride is gone. Hmm? The old habits are gone. The lustful looks are gone. The men. Is it gone? Oh, praise the Lord. Then these old things have been replaced with new things. Hallelujah. So there should be a replacement. If something goes away, something comes in. Praise the Lord. And then he says that if that is so, then the new creation is no longer a slave to sin. Is that happening in your life? Oh, hallelujah. So what we have done is that we have put off something. And we have put in on our own something. Do you understand that? That is why in Ephesians 4.24 he said, Put on the new created, we have put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. So we have put off something and Christ has put on us his likeness. So you are in the image of God and you are holy and righteous. Praise the Lord. Now all these attributes that we are saying you are is in Christ. Do you understand it? You look through Christ and you see your righteousness. If you look through this my brother sitting there, you, you won't believe it. But we want you to look through Christ. Hallelujah. So in Christ, we have been changed. So if you have put off the old nature, then what we are saying is that you are dead to sin. Okay? And a dead man has nothing to do. You don't even know what is happening. And therefore, immorality is gone. Is that true? Greediness is gone. Pride is gone. Cheating is gone. Lying is gone. Corruption is gone. And all others. Hallelujah. They are all gone. And now we have put on. Meaning that we are alive with Christ. Amen. And so what have we put on? Holiness. Righteousness. Oh, hallelujah. You are now somebody who worships God. As we are doing right now. You are a prayer warrior. Aren't you? You do service for him. You are bearing fruit, aren't you? You are holy. You love the brethren and the unbelievers. These are the things that have come to us. Humility, meekness, and forgiveness. So as you have put off the old nature, new nature who is like Christ has come to stay in your life and you are exhibiting these things. So you are righteous, so you are holy. Amen. So in Colossians 1.13, in making us qualified to be partakers of his inheritance, he says that God has delivered us from the power of darkness and now he has brought us to the kingdom of the son that he loves. Hallelujah. Now if you want to understand, and we try to let you go back to Egypt, where the Israelites were in bondage and in trouble. 
You saw how their tax masters gave them difficult times to work and they were in trouble. But God intervened and took them out of that place into the wilderness and then brought them to the promised land. You are in your promised land because you are a new creation. Similarly, we see that the devil, when we were in the old nature, gave us trouble. He put us in bondage. But Christ shone his light on us. And in that darkness, we have turned around. And because of Christ's light, we are now in the kingdom of God. And in that kingdom, we see holiness. We see joy. We see warmth. We see great things around us. And this is what he's saying we should go and exhibit it into the world. Be the possessor of the nations. Hallelujah. So you are going with these new attributes as a new creation. Now, like I said, these attributes of the new creation, if you are not careful, you say that I am a new creation, but it looks like I'm not able to do this. I want you to see it through the light of Jesus Christ. Amen. So he is our reflection. We reflect him. And therefore we are seeing you that you are a new creation now through Christ. Amen. Like I said, if you see it through me, you may think that is not it. So take it today that these things that we are talking about, the new creation exhibitions, is your position. Praise the Lord. That is your position in Christ. You are righteous. You are holy. Don't underestimate yourself. You are powerful. That is why we are saying today that the power of the new creation. You have all these attributes of Christ. You have been likened to Christ. And because we are seeing you through Christ, you are. That is your position. But you see, that is, has not been your practice. But when you desire Christ, and you move in him and you grow in him, you will see that with time, your position and your practice will merge. And then you know that really, you are the child of God. But I'm telling you today that that is your position. Christ has imputed his righteousness unto you. So you are a new creation. And you are a powerful person qualified to go to the world and to solve the problem. You are qualified to face Ghana's problem because you are righteous and you are holy and you love God. Hallelujah. So don't be afraid. You are qualified. Possess the nation, the power of the new creation. Now, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18, just one verse follow, following that, he said that all this is from God who has reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Praise the Lord. Some of us in this church, we don't have ministries. But today, the Bible is saying that you have. If you don't have anything, you have one ministry. What is the ministry? The ministry of reconciliation. So when he made you anew, it was not for free. It was not to come and sit down and warm the pew. But Christ has given you a job. That is his mission. That is his job. So when he saved you, he has given you a ministry of reconciliation. So you are going to reconcile the nations unto God. Hallelujah. You are studying as a mediator like Jesus Christ and reconciling the nations unto God. That's a powerful job. If you are not powerful, I don't know what again you are talking about. If I'm an ambassador and I'm the one who is connecting people to Christ, you have the power and you are a great person in the presence of God. So don't think that uh, me, I'm nothing. And you have a job to do. Your job is to reconcile men unto God. So please tell your brother you have a ministry of reconciliation to do. Remind him that you have a ministry of reconciliation. So when we talk about reconciliation, we are presupposing that there is some kind of quarrel or disagreement, a breach in relationship between man and God. There is a problem there. And that is why God has saved you, that you will stand in his stead to do this kind of job, which is the mission of Jesus Christ. 
So the relationship with God established with man at the beginning has broken down because of the act of sin. And ever since, man, ever since, man has lived in rebellion and enmity with God. So as the new creation, we have a job to do. The Bible declares that woe unto them that strive with their master. So you see, unbelievers are striving with God. And God says that we should do that. The only escape from God is for us to reconcile them unto God. So brethren, that is your job today. So this is indeed the mission of Christ. And believers are supposed to carry that mission. Because he said that, as my father has sent me, even so send I you. Hallelujah. In John 20, 21, that is what Christ is telling us. So you have a responsibility. And as a believer, what is your responsibility? Having been reconciled to God, believers have a responsibility of also reconciling other men unto God. So that is your job. And that is your ministry. A ministry of reconciliation. So that is what we have to do. Between men and God, we need to proclaim to the sinners. And we have to tell them of the mercy of God, the pardon of God, and the reconciliation message, and impress upon the sinner that God is willing to accept them. Hallelujah. He is willing to do that. This is our responsibility. Telling them about the peace of God. Telling them about the goodness of God. Telling them about the fact that there is pardon and forgiveness if they come. But Christ is ready and willing to save them. Now there are some terms of the reconciliation. Now these are the terms. God's term of reconciliation, the Bible says, is not burdensome. That is why when we go out and preaching the gospel, they are confused. Uh, is that all? So the first point on the term is that we are telling the sinner, acknowledge that you are a sinner. Just acknowledge that before his presence. Acknowledge. Secondly, repent of your sins. Thirdly, forsake them. Now, fourth, accept that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. And you receive pardon and forgiveness for your soul. Hallelujah. This is the terms of the condition. The reconciliation term. You are telling him to acknowledge his sins. You are telling him to repent. You are asking that just forsake about it. Accept this Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You have pardon. You have forgiveness. And this is the terms. So are we ready to go? So this ministry of reconciliation can be carried out. And you need wisdom. Because it's not easy. Those who have been doing the job, you know. You need wisdom. You need the power of God. You need to have a great burden in your heart for that job. Because it's an unfinished task for Jesus Christ. And that is what he has given to us to do. So we have to have burden. And it should be done through prayers. We need to pray for them. Because Christ expects us to go and bring them in. Now, let us read. There is a characteristic of unbelievers. And the people we have to go and get for Christ. If we know their characteristics, we will know what to do to bring them in. In Ephesians chapter 4, and the verse 17 to 19, we read first Ephesians 4, 24. This time we are reading Ephesians 4, and the verse 17 to 19, to just abreast ourselves with the characteristics of the unbelievers. Now, Ephesians 4, 17, he says that, So I tell you this, and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer be as the Gentiles do. In the futility of their thinking, they are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their heart, having lost all sensitivity. They have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity 
with the continual last for more. Hallelujah. So what I have jotted here from what I have read is that the characteristics of the unbelievers that we have to reach, the Bible is saying they are aimless. Aimless. Now, why are they aimless? They walk in the futility of their minds. Their life is empty, purposeless, and fruitless. They are aimless. Then we saw that they are blind. Their understanding is what? Darkened. They do not understand spiritual things. And you have been made anew. And this is your job to go and get them in. They are ungodly because they are alienated from God by the hardness of their hearts. Now they are shameless. Now my shameless here, you say they get over pain easily. Praise God. They are shameless. And they are immoral. They give themselves over to sensuality, if you, if you listen carefully. They are indecent. They give themselves up to any kind of uncleanness or impurity. Impurity. Then they are oft. In economics, I, lie, I learned this to they say insatiable or insatiable. Meaning that they are greedy and they are never satisfied. They are craving for more, even in sin. They continue and continue. So these are the characteristics of the people we must reach. Now, then Christ gave us that assignment of the Great Commission in Matthew 28, 19 to 20, Acts 1, 6 to 8, Mark 16 and 15. Now, there are three commands in it that we have to do, which is very simple. And you understand the first command was that go therefore and make disciples of all nations. So we are talking about all the tribes, all the people and uh, people groups, nations, tribes, tongues, everything. That is what we are supposed to do. So that is why our title is what's possessing the nations. Everywhere we are supposed to go. And it's a command. We should go. Therefore, we have to. We have no option. Then baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Immediately we get them, we have to baptize them. When, when we were in the church some time back, I was new convert class people. When we go and get them, we have to teach you for three months at least before we baptize you so that you will know everything in baptism. These days we've slightly changed it. Immediately we get them, we baptize them, and then we teach them. Hallelujah. So we need to do that. And then the third command is that teach them to observe all things that I have commanded you. So the evangelism doesn't end when you go and speak to them. We must bring them in and teach them every commandment until they grow. And then they will also reach out to others. This is this. So the essence of discipleship is becoming like the master. And we have to bring about systematic teaching and submission to the word of God. So we have to do that, and then we know. So brethren, the tax is very, very vast. And all of us should do it in obedience. We put our hands on the wheel and then do the work until the Great Commission tax is completed. If not, Christ is not coming. So we need to do the job so that he will come. Now, the one who is going to do the work. We have talked about characteristics of the people we are winning. Let me remind you, you know them, of the things, the qualities that you have to possess so that you can do the work effectively. Now, the first one is what we have talked, dealt with this morning, that you have to be born again. Hallelujah. Now, having been born again as we are, we must be men of the world. Because we are not able to go sometimes when you want to go. You remember that you are going to speak to somebody and say, hey, what am I going to say? But if you are a man of the word, you will know what to say. Praise God. As soon as you start, the words, the Holy Spirit will remind you it will be coming. But if you haven't read the Bible before, I don't know what is going to happen. Because the words will not come. Praise God. The Holy Spirit will not remind you. So we have to be aware, men. Of the word. Hallelujah. And we must be men of prayer. Because realizing that human effort cannot do the job, then we need to pray. Hallelujah. 
So we have to be praying. Then we must be filled with the love of God. Because the love will cause you to persevere. You go to the person and they throw you off, you won't go again. But if the love of God is in you and with you, you will persevere until the person becomes a Christian. Amen. Again, you will be able to share your resources, material resources with them. Sometimes you go and you try to win a soul and the soul becomes abatross on you. Have you uh, had that experience? He becomes what? Abatross on your neck. When you are coming to church, you have to go and pick him. You have to give him money. You have to do that. And you, hey, a, a human is on it here. Yes, it is not easy. But because of the love that you have as a soul winner, you should be able to go ahead and do that until Christ is formed in that person. Hallelujah. And you must be filled with the Holy Ghost. Because we say it's the Holy Ghost that does the conviction. It's not man. It's not how much eloquence and the way you talk that the person is looking for. But no. And, and you, are, you must be a man of faith. Why? Because sometimes there are Satan-inspired obstacles. Ask as the London, he will tell you. And if you don't have faith, you run away. You go there, as we are talking to them, so my mother is in the room, paralyzed. Can you pray for her to get up? And then you, you are looking left and right. Praise God. But you need faith. When he says, bring her. What? What do you mean? Bring her. Praise the Lord. Because in Mark 16, 15, he said that we should go. But when we go, we will speak new tongues. You will pray for the sick and they will be healed. Okay? You will pick serpents. And you will not be afraid. Hallelujah. So if we don't do it, those miracles we are looking for will not come. Praise the Lord. And it is then that you know that you are really a man or a woman of faith. So this is what we should do. And then we will know that, yes, we are doing that. And you should not be easily discouraged. If you are discouraged, you won't do the job. But you have a ministry to do. And your ministry is a ministry of reconciliation, remember. And you have to reconcile people to Christ. That is what Christ has made you. You are not a new creature for nothing. You are to reconcile people to Christ. Then, you must be selfless. You must be selfless. It means that you surrender all your talents, your money, your time, your everything. Amen. Uh-huh. Uh, that is the thing. So you make everything available to do that. We say we are going here, then you bring your money and we go. Amen. Now, when we read Matthew chapter 5 and verse 15, verse 5, 13, and 16 to 16, we read that believers are salt and we are also light. Amen. So first, you are likened to a salt. That is what Christ is saying. And we know that salt seasons food, isn't it? It is used as a preservative, and it brings out the flavor. So we believers should add flavor. We should add color. We should add vitality and spirit to the society in which we live. So in this life, if you are not there, there is no salt. And that must be seen. Anywhere that you go, there should be peace. If there is trouble, you should calm the place. So because you are in this country, calm the environment. Things are hard. Yes, but you say Christ will do it. Praise the Lord. Don't go conversing and tell everybody it's so hard and, and confuse the issue. It's already there. But we are the salt of this world. And we are the light. They are looking for something from us. And you must show, exhibit that character and that power that Christ has given to you. And tell them that it shall be well. And it will be well. So wherever you are, you should be a salt. And then he has a question. If a salt loses its taste, its flavor, what are we going to do? I don't know. The women know it better. If the salt is even contaminated, you cannot add it to the soup. 
So, we have to make sure that we don't lose our saltiness, our flavor. And all the time we should be on top. And the people will see it and give glory to God. Hallelujah. Then secondly, he's saying that we are like light. But if you go to John chapter 8 verse 12, Christ himself that I am the light of this world. And then he's telling us that we are also light of this world. So what it means is that we take our source of light from Christ. Praise the Lord. And he expects us to shine in the whole world. He is saying that a city that is built on the mountains cannot be hidden. Because all other cities will be below the mountain and they will see it. So this light that he has given to you must shine and cover all darkness wherever you are. Remember you are light. Don't hold your light. The light that you have, you put it on a stand so all will see. He's talking about the character you possess now. He has given you holiness. He has given you humility. He has given you love. He has... Are people seeing this? They must be on the lamp hold, lamp stand, so that the people in the house will see it. And when we have done that, the Bible says that everybody will give glory to God who is in heaven. So brethren, this is your child. You have a ministry of reconciliation. And you are salt, And you are the light. If that is it, then our saltiness and our lies should be brought to bear on the situations that we find ourselves in Ghana now. I know and I have heard that people are complaining. Pentecost leadership just said that we should fast and pray so God will listen to us and come to our aid. And somebody is confused. Why? Why didn't they tell the, 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 the politicians long ago and they are now saying it? What is your problem? You are in trouble. And those who have been cleansed by the blood of the Lamb say they are praying so they are God will fix the problem. And you say no. But what do you want again? Brethren, let us move on because our God is willing and ready to do it. All that we need is that we need to pray. And he says that if we humble ourselves and we pray, he, the Lord, will fix the problem. So we believe very, very sure that God will fix the problem of this country. You think this one will kill us? No. It is only Christ. It is only God that will bring the world into an end. It is not economic crisis. Because he will do it. And he is God. He won't let anybody confuse the issue. So God will come to visit the nation. We want you to have that assurance and pray. So everywhere you are going, you tell them that I am the salt and the light. My God says he will fix the problem. Let us assure the countries of the world that our God liveth. We have been born again and we are new creation. We qualify to possess the nations by that power that he has given to us. So we are looking unto you that you take up your ministry of reconciliation and bring people to God. God bless you.